Thank you very much. Welcome to my webinar and thank you for joining me this evening. It's a pleasure to be able to be in your homes and offices tonight. My name is Carla Cohn. I come to you from Winnipeg, which is in central Canada. Before we begin, just a little bit more about my background. I've had the pleasure of practicing dentistry for more than 20 years. I do spend the majority of my time in my private practice, but in addition to some clinical teaching at our dental college, I also enjoy speaking on many aspects of clinical pediatric dentistry geared towards the private practitioner. I'm a member of Catapult Elite, uh, which is a group of key opinion leaders who have the opportunity to trial and evaluate new and emerging technologies. And as well, we're called upon to contribute our opinions and findings as educators to our colleagues and peers. Beyond that relationship, I choose which materials to use in my practice on a daily basis, just as you do. And I pay for my materials, just as you pay for your materials. My topic tonight is pediatric zirconia crowns and their cementation with a novel calcium aluminate cement. I speak to you tonight to share with you the clinical indications for pediatric prefabricated zirconia crowns, specifically new smile zirconia pediatric crowns, their rationale and ease of preparation, and their reliable cementation with a calcium aluminate cement, Ceramir from DOXA. My disclosure is that I have no financial interest in any of the products that I speak about. However, I do receive an educational grant for this webinar. The opinions that I put forth are my own, as well all of the clinical photos with the exception of two and all of the videos that I will show you tonight are my own. At the end of tonight's webinar, there will be a question and answer discussion period and I'll answer as many questions and address as many comments as I'm able. If you do wish to take note, my personal contact information is on the bottom right of this slide. My website has links to some of the articles that I've written as well as some procedural summaries. And the Catapult Elite website lists my course titles as well as my speaking schedule. On my personal website, the drcarlacone.com, if you wish to go on there and look at a procedural summary, you click on that procedural summary, they're password protected. The password is incisor, type in the incisor, and then that summary will come up with that procedure. So we'll have the procedures that we talk about tonight as well as some uh, many that we will not cover. If there's one thing that's important in pediatric dentistry, it's to keep it simple. And by that, I mean make it an easy procedure for our patients, but also an easy procedure for us as clinicians. Simpler is not always better, but simpler often is equated with less operator error, as well as being often equated with faster procedure times. This means that our procedures are quicker for those of us with either personal or patient short attention span. And for those of us who have little patients with little patients, and those of us who have little patients for our little patients. Of course, let's keep it simple. Easy, fast procedures increase our chance of improved behavior, ours and our patients, and truly successful appointment. One of the most important aspects of patient's behavior management is to know what is a practical procedure for that patient, to choose materials and techniques wisely. We must always ask ourselves if our patient behavior will allow for a dry environment that will permit us to use our hydrophobic materials, or whether patient behavior makes for an environment full of spit, one in which we must choose a more forgiving procedure and hydrophilic materials. Keeping it simple is of no use unless we have reliability. Reliability in procedures that are repeatable and results that are successful. We absolutely must have reliability in materials that do what they are meant to do. We must demand materials that perform to the standard of excellence that they promise, to the standard of excellence that we require, to the standard of excellence that our patients deserve. Remember always that we have many dental material alternatives available to us. It can at times be overwhelming to look at all the choices. We need to be aware of what is out there and available to us. If we have tunnel vision and remain living in the past, perhaps only to techniques and materials that we've mastered many years ago, then we limit our patients to only those materials and techniques. 
If all we're proficient at are composites, then every carious lesion will receive a composite restoration. If all we have in our armamentarium are stainless steel crowns and old generation cements, then that is all that we will be able to provide. In short, if all that we have is a hammer, then everything will look like a nail. Dentistry has so much more to offer in new and emerging materials and techniques. We owe it to our patients and to ourselves to be able to provide options to our patients. As I said at the outset, tonight's webinar will focus on very practical clinical scenarios. My intention is to bring practical procedures to you in order for you to implement these into your practice right away. Or if you're already familiar with these materials, to offer some insight to make these techniques even more successful. I would like to address anterior restorations at the beginning of tonight's discussion. We have several choices to be made when we're faced with anterior lesions and several challenges as well. I have full coverage at the top of the list because in my opinion and experience, it's a most reliable choice with very high chance of success. I'll spend a good portion of today's webinar discussing full coverage in the form of prefabricated pediatric zirconia crowns, as of course the title of the webinar describes. So you ask why full coverage will increase our success rate of treatment of anterior decay. Allow me to offer my insights. Let's look at the success of intracoronal restoration on an anterior primary tooth. Or rather, I should say, let's look at the failure of intracoronal restorations. Success, retention, and longevity of intracoronal restorations are very, very poor. Let's look at some of the reasons why. The overall size of primary anterior teeth is small, and thus even the smallest of lesions have a very close proximity to a relatively large pulp. When we look at traditional intracoronal methods of restoration with composite restora resin restorations, we need to realize that retention is almost entirely from etch and bond. Given that the thickness of enamel of a primary tooth is approximately half that of a permanent tooth, our retention, to put it crudely, is possibly only half as good. Many children are bruxers and combined with daily wear and tear, Flexure is a problem. If you visualize the tooth flexing with every grind, it doesn't take too much imagination to see that fillings can pop out easily. And finally, behavior can be a challenge. I'm referring here to the child's behavior, not yours. Years ago, before we had reliable restorative options like the aesthetic full coverage crowns that I'll discuss tonight, we had very few alternatives and many, many decayed anterior teeth were doomed to be extracted. Today we have better, stronger, more reliable alternatives and can save these teeth for our kids, allowing them to chew, smile, and develop proper speech. Remember, kids are full of spit. Sometimes it's like a geyser in their mouths. I ask you, is it not a challenge to keep a dry field when placing all of our moisture sensitive bonding materials? Placement of full coverage prefabricated restorations offer us success even if our field of operation is not completely dry. Risk is another factor to take into consideration. These kids presenting with smooth surface caries under the age of five are categorized as having severe early childhood caries. They're high risk for caries and full coverage is recommended for our high risk kids according to clinical guidelines put forth by American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Very shortly, I'll share with you one of my cases of recurrent decay in a conservatively treated child to drive home that point. Let's look at the cost of placing a full coverage restoration once versus intracoronal restorations that have high failure rates and then replacing those intracoronal restorations at no charge over and over and over again when they fail. Never mind having the child go through repeated procedures, never mind having the clinician go through those repeated no charge procedures 
And I don't have to tell you the parents are not impressed when restorations fail. Remember that your most valuable asset is your chair time, not your materials. And finally, full coverage crowns are simple to prepare and place and much less technique sensitive than working with our adhesives and composite materials. And the options for full coverage crowns are stainless steel crowns. This is all we used to have. I don't think I even need to comment on this photo. This disclaimer on this one here is that this is not my patient and not my photo. It takes a certain kind of personality to get away with this kind of look. This is also not my patient. It's no surprise that this article from Dr. Kroll in 1998 quoted parents as preferring to have these anterior teeth extracted rather than having stainless steel crowns placed. Mercifully, some dentists would cut windows and then fill these with composite for a more aesthetic appearance. You can be the judge of this outcome. Once again, this is not my patient. Now we have pre-veneered stainless steel crowns, which have been a great improvement, both aesthetically and functionally. This is my patient, and these are New Smile signature crowns. These are the first generation of aesthetic crowns from New Smile, and we have a cuspid to cuspid case here of the New Smile signature crowns. And finally, we have the latest generation of the aesthetic pediatric crowns. These are zirconia prefabricated pediatric crowns. Zirconia crowns are manufactured by a few different companies in the United States and around the world. The crowns that I'll focus on tonight are the New Smile Zirconia crowns. They're from a company out of Houston, Texas and are made of monolithic zirconium. The aesthetics of these crowns are unsurpassed. The strength of this material is nine times that of natural teeth. The crowns have an internal retention built into the interior of the crown. They're fully autoclavable and I'll show you just how easy they are to, to place. I've included here at the bottom of this slide the insurance coding for reimbursement for this procedure. This is the lineup of the incisors of the prefabricated zirconia crowns from New Smile. These are the four anteriors lateral to lateral. They come in two shades, light and extra light. And you can see that the contour closely follows that of a natural tooth with the constriction as the crown meets the cervical portion of the tooth. You can see how thin the material is with this view of the internal aspect of the crown. It's approximately one millimeter in thickness and that will allow for a natural looking restoration. There are several advantages of zirconia crowns. They're the great aesthetics, far surpassing anything that we have available to date. They really are very, very pretty. For many years, there have been aesthetic alternatives for permanent teeth, and now we're finally seeing aesthetics for pediatrics that can rival those. These crowns have good retention, and even better once I discuss the bioactive cementation. Moisture and hemorrhage control are not critical to success of this restoration, which is hugely advantageous in children's dentistry. Minimal chair time is required for the completion of this procedure. And finally, these crowns offer full coverage prote protection that is required for success. But wait, we cannot seem to have advantages without disadvantages. There is an increased cost of the materials, Although New Smile comes in as the least expensive zirconia alternative available in the world of prefabricated pediatric crowns. More aggressive tooth preparation is required, but aren't these teeth devastated with decay? Isn't that how they got to us in the first place? Chipping or fracture is a possibility, and although the clinical data is not yet established for this yet, I personally have placed very, very many of these crowns and have not had any difficulty whatsoever with chipping or fracture. And finally, color match can be a challenge as two shades are offered. However, when they're placed in multiples, as they most often are, the color is not an issue. 
It's of utmost importance to ensure success that cases are selected properly. Select cases with no anterior crossbites. You're simply asking for trouble in these anterior crossbite cases with fracture of the restoration. No severe crowding. These crowns cannot be squeezed mesiodistally and they must fit passively. Severely crowded dentition require over-preparation in order to fit all crowns simultaneously. Some clinical crown must remain. We need to be able to have retention from the remaining crown. The retention will be affected by the amount of tooth structure remaining after preparation. And as I've already mentioned, we have the best aesthetics when multiple crowns are placed. Let's take a look at a case that shows you why full coverage is indicated and how you can get into trouble by not being thorough enough in the first place and aesthetics all rolled into one. This is a preoperative photo of a two-year-old little boy who presented with traditional severe early childhood caries. This is an immediate post-op of some composite restorations. These are conservative restorations, maintain some good tooth structure. I thought I was doing some good conservative dentistry, but how wrong I was. Within one year, this child was back with recurrent decay more decalcification, and new decay on surfaces that had not previously been restored. Let's take a look at this case and allow me to show you the steps involved in restoring these anterior teeth with zirconia restorations. The first step is crown size selection. The best way to do this is to hold the crown to the tooth to be restored and estimate the mesiodistal width. You're not seeing things. That crown I was holding up is pink, not white. New Smile has a try-in crown that we use for all sizing and try-in. They are sized to match the zirconia crowns, but colored to allow for try-in. We use these in order to prevent contamination from saliva and hemorrhage. We could call them try-in sizers. Let's digress and discuss this role of the pink try-in crown briefly. Cementation to the zirconia crowns occurs by the binding of the phosphate groups, the resin modified glass ionomer or resin cement to the receptors on the zirconia. This is a hydrophobic reaction of the resin cement to the zirconia. When blood and saliva are present, Blood and saliva contain phosphates that will bind to these receptors as well. In a contaminated field, blood and saliva phosphates take up the receptors that would be used by the resin modified glass ionomer cement. If these receptors are all taken up by the contaminants in blood and saliva at the try-in stage, then the cement cannot adhere to the zirconia. Instead, either it must be cleaned by micro-etching or with products like IvaClean from IvaClar, which is a zirconia-rich paste that can pull away the phosphates and leave the zirconia clean. Or it must not be contaminated in the first place by using a try-in crown. Can we play the video attached to this? Introducing New Smile Try and Crowns, another trusted tool from New Smile. New Smile Try and Crowns are precision manufactured to be identical in size and shape to New Smile ZR crowns and can be used repeatedly for trial fitting and preparation refinement. New Smile Try and Crowns eliminate the additional preparation and cleaning steps that are necessary for successful results with any zirconia or all ceramic restoration. Designed in bright pink, they're easy to identify within your new Smile ZR kit. Saliva, blood, or phosphoric acid contains various phosphates, which have been scientifically proven to be attracted to and to chemically bond to zirconia surfaces. These phosphate groups bonded on the ceramic surface cannot be easily removed by standard cleaning procedures and can negatively impact cement retention. New Smile Try and Crowns ensure the prepared internal surface of the actual crown to be cemented is not contaminated, ensuring a long-lasting smile. 
New Smile Try-In Crowns are quick and easy to use, eliminate extra steps, and provide confidence that your completed New Smile ZR restoration will last. New Smile Pediatric Crowns, committed to pediatric dentistry and your clinical success. Terrific. So the use of the pink try-in crown will prevent the contamination of the crown to be cemented. The try-in crowns uh, can then be cleaned and autoclaved for future use. So back to our case and our preparation. The complete preparation of the four anterior teeth is shown here. What you're aiming for is about a 20% reduction of tooth structure incisally and circumferentially to allow for the fit of the crown. Remember that you're cutting the tooth to fit the crown. The preparation needs to extend subgingival by about one to two millimeters and you need to have a feather edge margin. Try in of all of the crowns simultaneously is very important in order to check your preparations that they all seat passively, the correct orientation and alignment. And checking the occlusion is critical. Once placed, you do not want to adjust the occlusion. These zirconia crowns, as I've said, have about one millimeter of thickness of material and any adjustment may lead to perforation at worst, loss of the nice manufacturer shine at the best. If occlusion is not correct, you go back at this point and adjust your preparation to allow for more complete seating of the crown. And in some instances, you may need to adjust the opposing tooth. This is an immediate post cementation. New Smile has a quick start guide that will help guide you through the steps of this procedure. And it really is a, a very short learning curve. The crowns are provided in a kit that has the crown sorted as to left or right and sizes similar to a stainless steel crown kit. The kit will hold the try-in crowns as well. New Smile has burrs available to prep with as well as adjustment kits. This is another case with some severe decay and decalcification. Uh, with this, we have teeth that have pulpal involvement as well, as all of the challenges I've already described, the flex of the tooth, maintaining a dry field, hemorrhage control. This is a palatal view of that same child. Uh, preparation for the new smile zirconia crowns. Tooth E has been treated with an indirect pulp cap and tooth F has been treated with some vital pulp therapy. Try-in of the New Smile Pink Crowns. Again, be sure that all crowns fit passively at the same time. This is the time that you want to determine if any adjustments to the preparation are needed, not at the time of cementation. And if any refinements to preparation need to be made, they should be made now. At this point, uh, occlusion is checked. This is perhaps the only time that I'm grateful for a late pacifier habit, creating a, a situation for me in which I have a nice anterior open bite. This is immediate post cementation. Palatal view, post cementation, immediate post cementation. And this is 10 days post-operatively. So you can see the, the gingival healing that will occur in just 10 days. And this is one happy, cool dude. Uh, this young lady is three years old, presented with a case of cuspid to cuspid decay. Patient's right side with some severe decay on her lateral and lesser so on her incisor and cuspid. Left side, similar presentation. And this is her one month postoperatively. Uh, this is a case with some severe bruxing combined with some traditional cervical decay. In fact, his whole mouth had a similar pattern of decay. This is his immediate post-op, one month post-op, and his incisal view one month post-op. And finally, take this case as food for thought. This little boy, just barely two, 
had trauma to his incisor. I think this was a bathtub accident, if I recall correctly. Look also at all of the damage to the enamel of the right central incisor. He had his pulp exposed and a pulpectomy was needed. After pulpectomy, we need to have full coverage if the tooth in question needs to remain in place for more than a year. And so he was a candidate for new smile zirconia crowns as well. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to show you a procedural video of an anterior new smile preparation and cementation. So if you could run this video for me, please. Can you all hear me? Okay, I uh, did the video continue to play because I lost I lost connection. Okay, and did you see the full video? Okay, I'm getting yeses. You saw the full video. All right, that's good because I sure didn't. Um, so okay, let's let's move on. That was our uh, that was our anterior video. 
Um, we'll go on to the on to the next slide. So uh, when you're ordering these crowns, these crowns need to be ordered direct from the manufacturer. You cannot get them from your supply company. You can order them online uh, or you can order them at that 1-800 number. Okay. Um, so we'll move on to talk about the cementation of these crowns. For those of us that are focused on pediatric dentistry, zirconia is a brand new material. And so we need to look at our cementation protocol. So very briefly, I want to summarize the contemporary cements that we have today. The first two categories are glass ionomer cements that are available in either pure glass ionomer formulation or a resin modified glass ionomer formulation. Um, the second and third categories are our resin cements. Resin cements can be further subcategorized into total etch and self-etch. And the final category is a bioceramic cement, which is a unique bioactive and biomimetic material. Your choice of cement will depend upon the strengths of each given choice in each clinical scenario. So an ideal cement needs to possess the following qualities. Uh, according to a literature review of contemporary permanent looting agents used in dentistry, that was published in IDR in 2011. It should be well adapted to living tissues. It should be non-irritating to the pulp. We do not want to see any pulpal reactions, nor do we want any discomfort, either upon cementation or post-cementation. It needs to be non-toxic. And an ideal cement should be anti-cariogenic. This is one point not limited to pediatric dentistry, of course, but perhaps discussed in pediatric dentistry to a greater degree than other avenues. Our desire to help our patients to be cavity free and our concern for the overall health leads us on a quest for materials that can offer this advantage to our patients. And one of our difficulties with certain cement categories, of course, are the solubility of the material. In the mouth with the saliva continually bathing our restorations, we desire cement that will not dissolve, will not wash away. Ideally, we desire a low film thickness, although this is much more of a factor in general dentistry when traditional crowns are fabricated to fit the tooth precisely versus the prefabricated crowns that I'm discussing tonight in which the tooth is cut to fit the crown. More often than not, in pediatric full coverage cases, we have a situation in which we are restoring severely decayed teeth and our remaining clinical crown is minimal. Film thickness is not as critical in this application. An ideal quality is low viscosity. A material with low viscosity will allow the advantage to flow properly and cover all surfaces uh, sufficiently. And of course, we want our cements to resist mastication forces. This is another quality which is of utmost importance in our child patients. They cannot and will not be careful and what, with what or how they eat. And our cement must have the properties to overcome these forces. Light transparency is crucial to allow for a natural looking restoration. An ideal quality listed is heat insulation. Our mouths are subject to no end of abuse. First, we have hot soup followed by cold ice cream. Day after day, we expect and demand that our materials hold up to these assaults. We need to have sufficient working time to allow for proper cementation. In the cases you just seen, we're placing four, sometimes six anterior restorations simultaneously. We need sufficient working time to place these crowns. Bonds to hard tissue. Well, this should be a no-brainer. We must have a reliable bond to teeth. And finally, a long shelf life is ideal. Remember, kids are full of spit. Our cement needs to be moisture tolerant. In pediatric dentistry, you have the unique situation in that preparation of final cementation take place at the same appointment. As you know, and as I've demonstrated in the clinical photos, there is no time for gingival healing between prep and final cementation, as there is with traditional crown and bridge or implant procedures. And so it's critical that our cement of choice is moisture tolerant. 
In addition, in pediatric dentistry, we have less than ideal preps, subgingival margins in an operative area that's contaminated with blood and saliva, and so it is very critical to choose your cement wisely. Furthermore, with all of the cements discussed, properties are measured and evaluated with a very thin layer of cement. We know that in pediatric dentistry, we're cutting the tooth to fit the crown, whereas in traditional adult crown bridge, crowns are made to fit the preparation. Fits are not precise in pediatric dentistry, and so it's critical to choose your cement wisely. Furthermore, working with children, time is of the utmost importance. There's no time to waste with fussy steps, and so it's critical to choose your cement wisely. I'd like to take you through each category, if you will, of cements, the glass ionomer cements, resin cements, and ultimately the bioactive cement. Glass ionomer cements have been a consistent, reliable cement for many years and are a staple of dentists who work with children. GI cements are moisture tolerant, and so saliva and hemorrhage control are not critical with these cements. In addition, glass ionomers release fluoride, which aids in remineralization of not only the tooth in question, but additionally adjacent teeth. The differences between traditional glass ionomers and resin modified glass ionomers is, as the name implies, the addition of a resin component. This addition allows the resin modified glass ionomer cements to be insoluble in the oral environment. Resin cements rely upon a micromechanical bond to both the tooth structure and the restorative material. They're insoluble in the oral fluids. Total etch resin cements require pretreatment of the tooth surface, whereas self etch resin cements do not require this pretreatment. Bond strengths of self etch resin cements are high and total etch resin cements even higher. But resin cements require a dry field. And this is our difficulty in our pediatric population, as it's difficult at best to maintain that dry field. I want to introduce you to a new product, a calcium aluminate bioactive biomimetic cement called Ceramir that's manufactured by a Swedish company called Doxa. Ceramir cement is a nanostructurally integrated bioceramic material. It has a water-based hybrid composition. It has a calcium aluminate and glass ionomer component that's mixed with distilled water. The calcium aluminate gives Ceramir its unique properties. The acid-base reaction consists of water mixing together with a calcium aluminate, which is a chemically bonded ceramic, or CBC, to create the final cement material. This reaction, by virtue of the water component, makes the cement hydrophilic. This hydrophilicity allows us to use Ceramir in an operative field that is not dry, as is most often the case in pediatric procedures. Ceramir, once it's setting, then begins a dissolution process in which the calcium, aluminum, and hydroxy precipitate from the final cement. This precipitation of the ions from Ceramir is rapid and repeated. Once the ions of calcium, aluminum, and hydroxy rise to a sufficient level, new permanent nanostructures begin to form. Nanocrystals, or hydrates of catoite or calcium alumina hydrate, are formed, as well as formation of gibbsite gel matrix, which is alumina hydroxide. This alumina hydroxide ion bonds to the zirconia or metal oxide surface and initiates nucleation of the final hydrate. These nanocrystals need to start growing on something, a nucleation site, which is the surface of the zirconia. A bond is created between the substrate and the first monolayer of nanosized crystals that grow on the substrate. The material itself is then built up by these nanocrystals in combination with the more gel-like aluminum hydroxide and the polysalt of the glass ionomer. The extremely small size of the individual crystals that makes up a large part of this material allows for the entire surface of the substrate to be utilized for bonding. When ceramir comes into contact with apatite, a mixed zone of chemically formed apatite is established. Catoite and gibbsite allow attachment to the tooth structure by nanostructural integration. Thus, the category of nanostructurally integrated bioceramics. In this study, published in the journal Dental Research, the retention of ceramir to zirconia is higher than that of self-adhesive res uh, resin cement. 
The calcium aluminate fixes the glass ionomer structure and will prevent its dissolution over time. Our saliva is supersaturated with calcium and phosphate, and when ceramir comes into contact with phosphate ions in the oral fluids, it forms apatite. In addition, the material produces an excess of calcium ions, which encourages remineralization. Both the apatite formation and the release of calcium ions develop quickly and continue to be active. Given its formulation, ceramir is both bioactive in that it produces apatite formation and remineralizes, and biomimetic in that this mimics nature's production of these minerals. Immediately after setting, the pH of ceramir is slightly acidic at 4.5. After an hour, the pH neutralizes, and three to four hours later, the pH is basic at approximately 8.5. The hardened material then maintains its basic pH at 8.5. This basic pH is very significant to its biocompatibility and bioactivity. We've been using our glass ionomer cements for many years, and one of the attractive qualities of glass ionomer is its ability to release fluoride and thus remineralize. The question is, can we do better? If we look at ceramir cement and if we examine its alkaline pH in the equation, it becomes clear that pH is a very powerful factor and key factor in the carry cycle. We can easily see how a very alkaline pH of 8.5 like that of ceramir, ceramir will be a very effective antibacterial. Caryogenic bacteria are both acidogenic, producing acid, and aciduric, growing well in an acid medium. If we take away that acidic environment in which they proliferate by providing an alkaline pH, we can interrupt the caries cycle. In this study published in the International Journal of Dentistry, ceramir was the only cement that provided an antibacterial effect after one to seven days. In our fluoride releasing materials, the fluoride released is bound up after only a short period of time, thus its antibacterial effect is limited. Furthermore, there was no correlation between either acidic materials or fluoride release and antibacterial properties evident. Rather, basic materials showed stronger antibacterial properties. Ceramir is a kind cement to the tooth. It's uh, leaving no postoperative sensitivity. It has thermal coefficient of expansion that is similar to that of tooth structure. It expands and contracts at the same rate of the tooth, and because of this marginal integrity, it can be maintained. And furthermore, it doesn't have the unpleasant taste of our glass ionomer and resin cements. And so, in summary, ceramir is a bioceramic calcium aluminate. Let me go back one. Uh, bioceramic calcium aluminate. It displays excellent strength and retention. It's biocompatible, bioactive, and biomimetic. Properties of sealing that tooth interface. Long-term properties of no degradation. Basic NPH, NPH is basic, allows for its unique anticarogenic properties. And in short, it's good for our patients as a smart material to use. It's effective for all pediatric cement applications. So if you're still using a dumb cement, it's time to switch to the smart one. The company will provide an activator uh, in the, in the uh, startup kit. The capsule needs to be activated for a full three seconds. You do need to have a triturator to mix this cement. And once triturated, the nozzle must be rotated 180 degrees, and then the cement can be applied. Working time is two minutes, followed by a rubbery phase, and that's your cleanup phase then the excess material can simply be peeled away. Final set time is four to five minutes. DOXA will provide a technique card as well, and uh, Ceramir is available through Henry Schein. Um, we have another video, if we could play this video. I hope I don't lose connection uh, again with this video. Bear with me if we do. Um, just a short video with the technique of the uh, Ceramir mixing uh, trituration and application onto a typodont.
And there we go. Um, so that's the Ceramir technique. That's how it's placed and, and why we like to use it. So I want to um, finish tonight's presentation by covering posterior, no pun intended. Let's look at our options for treating this clinical scenario. Let me give you the following assumptions for this, this child. This is a healthy, cooperative five-year-old child, no radiographic evidence of interproximal decay, uh, asymptomatic, no pulpal involvement. Um, so what do you think that our options may be for this child for treatment? Let's take a closer look uh, at, this, at this case in question. I've done my occlusal reduction preparation uh, in uh, the first step for full coverage. And I'm showing you this view so that you can closely examine the extent of that decay. Now, how much of that decay would have remained unexcavated if this were to be an intracoronal restoration? You simply would not be able to visualize and excavate this. Equally important is the remain, remaining tooth structure. So I ask you to look at what's going to be remaining of the lingual and buccal walls. If this were to be an intracoronal restoration, where is that failure going to be? This extent of decay is simply too great for an intracoronal restoration. You can see by this example that it's very, very easy to underestimate the extent of decay. And although we have very strong composite restorations, resin modified glass ionomer uh, uh, materials that have uh, good strength, what ends up failing is not the composite or the resin modified glass ionomer necessarily, but the remaining tooth structure that we haven't dealt with, decay that we've been unable to excavate. Let's look at this example of decay that's devastated the marginal ridge of the first primary molar. Any situation in which a marginal ridge is consumed by decay is an indication for full coverage. And again, by virtue of the extent of the decay uh, and additionally the insufficient remaining tooth structure. Any clinical situation in which we have pulpal involvement is an indication for full coverage, except in the instance when the tooth is less than 12 months from exfoliation. Take a look at these failures. Pay attention to the right maxillary first and second primary molars. They've both been pulpally treated and then failed due to leakage of the restoration. Both of these teeth needed to be extracted. Entirely preventable if full coverage had been placed initially. Now take a look at the mandibular left uh, second primary molar, the one that's supported by that band from that space maintainer. We have another failure by too conservative a treatment. Now granted, we don't know what the behavior was like for this child. We don't know what the situation of the dentist was, um, but failure after a very short period of time in each and every quadrant. So again, we look at another uh, uh, quadrant on this child, and again, we have failure. You know, we only need to have eight to 10 years of success on these restorations before that tooth exfoliates. Let's do it right the first time. Stainless steel crowns, full coverage, have a one and a half to nine times higher success rate as compared to class two restorations. I know that's a great big span. That's a review of literature of 10 separate studies. And even if you look at the low end of that, one and a half times the success rate is very significant. The main reasons for failure of class two restorations, most common reasons are fracture and secondary caries. The average lifespan of a class two restoration in a primary tooth intracoronal is two years. The average lifespan of that beta fish is two years. So in summary, you look at the indications for full coverage according to American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry, that's high caries risk patients, lesions that are large, extensive, and multiple, or teeth with pulpal involvement. These teeth have large lesions that required full coverage, and so I placed stainless steel crowns, but parents aren't happy with silver-colored teeth. 
And kids aren't happy necessarily with silver colored teeth either. It doesn't take a study to show us this, but nonetheless one was done. It was concluded that tooth colored restorations are preferred to amalgam by both parents and children. Now you have to ask yourself, who's the boss? You went to school for six, seven, eight years to become a dentist and now you have a parent dictating treatment. Well, you have good company if that's the case. This article from Pediatric Dentistry showed that many pediatric dentists acquiesce to parents' wishes when challenged about the material with which they have chosen to restore a posterior primary tooth. And when considering the restoration of a posterior primary tooth, the parent's chief concern is aesthetics as reported by pediatric dentists. In fact, this article goes on to state that 43% of pediatric dentists provided modified treatment to what they initially recommended. I take from these studies the following. Families are demanding aesthetic restorations, without a doubt. Unless you have the armamentarium to place aesthetic full coverage restorations, you're left with one of three options. Either you insist on treatment with an unesthetic stainless steel crown, you place a too large tooth colored intracoronal restoration that's doomed for failure, or you refer the patient out to someone who's prepared to offer what the patient requires and what they're demanding. So for the cases in which full coverage is required and aesthetics are demanded, New Smiles developed a line of posterior zirconia crowns, Again, they're available in light and extra light with an additional narrow first primary molar available for those cases in which we have space loss. I'll take you through a case of zirconia crown placement for this first primary molar. Sizing of the crown. Sorry, sizing of that crown with the pink try-in crowns. Uh, this slide shows occlusal and circumferential preparation completed. At first, super gingival to allow a clear field of vision, and then subgingival circumferential preparation. Again, your final preparation should be about 20% reduction with a subgingival feather edge margin. Try-in of the crown should give you a passive fit. Remember, these cannot be squeezed mesial distally, you don't crimp them, and then you need to remove the rubber dam and check that occlusion. This is immediately post-cementation, another view immediate post-operatively, and this is the buckle view of the occlusion immediately post-cementation. This is 10 days post-operatively, and buckle view 10 days post-operatively, and we have really nice, beautiful gingival health 10 days post-operatively. Uh, another case of a zirconia crown placed on first primary maxillary molar. Radiographic view showing the extent of that decay. Preparation of the tooth complete. Immediate post cementation. 10 days post operatively. Buckle view 10 days post operatively. And I have one final procedure video for you to view. So if we could load our last video.
Terrific. So my hope is that this webinar will provide you with a starting point to when and how to place aesthetic full coverage restorations, cement them successfully. It's a really, truly a very small investment for a very big reward. Your patients and their parents will certainly thank you for it. And now I'll bring you to the end of my presentation. I thank you for joining me for your kind attention. We'll open up to some question and answers and you'll be able to type in your questions and I can answer them or your comments, um, whatever you see fit. And once again, if you're signing off, thank you again for joining me and have a pleasant rest of the evening. Does this material wear the opposing dentition? It, it will wear the opposing dentition if your occlusion is not uh, correct. Uh, that was from Chrissy, Hannah, thank you for the presentation, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, can you trim these uh, ZR crowns? I would absolutely not trim the ZR crowns. Uh, they do have an adjustment kit uh, from New Smile that you can adjust them. I don't like to touch them. Uh, I, I prefer to adjust my tooth to fit the crown seat it more fully, um, and uh, and so we. I, I don't. I don't like to. Uh, I don't like to touch them. Even in excursives, we're talking about the uh, the uh, uh, wear of the opposing dentition. I've not seen it uh, yet clinically. The crowns, the posterior crowns, have only been around for a couple of years, so nothing has has shown up long term. Uh, we don't, uh, of course, have the data long term because they just simply haven't been been around long enough. Okay, I think I'm any other any other questions? Comes oh, there we go. Would I would I recommend in, in hypo occlusion? No, I wouldn't recommend in hypo occlusion. You, you know you want to have it it in occlusion. It's um in hypo occlusion you're gonna gonna wind up with super eruption of the opposing tooth, uh, so it's it's not it's not a, a great idea. I do like those anterior open bites when I'm uh, when I'm doing those anteriors for these. I must admit, though. Um, thank you, thank you, Earl, for that uh, nice comment. Uh, um, uh, so, okay, a uh, question from Eric. Um, do I find it difficult to try in the passive fit crowns? I, I'm assuming you're talking about the pink ones uh, with the younger patients in the chair versus the, the OR. Um, I, I always have a rubber dam on these kids at the initial try-in, um, and then you know, it, it, it does take a, a little extra patience to get that occlusion checked when you've got a, cement, a crown that's not cemented in yet. Um, but, uh, but it's certainly very manageable. Any other thoughts? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Is it necessary to have the margin subgingival? Uh, you know, we, we like the margin subgingival. It certainly gives you a better aesthetic look. Is it absolutely necessary to have them subgingively? You know, probably not. Uh, but uh, definitely the aesthetics are, are nicer with the subgingival margin. Yeah, and uh, that's true. Sub G, thank you, John, will we'll also uh, help reduce uh, the recurrent decay. What was, the, what was the ADA code that I used and what is the range of fees? Uh, well, I can for sure give you that ADA code again. Um, range of fees really varies uh, across the country. And, and also keep in mind that I'm, I'm coming to you from Canada, so I can't really comment on, on the fees in the States. Um, but what, what I'll do is, now you, I'm, just, uh, I'm just pulling up that, that ADA code again for you. Um, so the ADA code is D2929. Um, and, uh, and that's uh, described as a single crown prefabricated porcelain ceramic substrate. So that's what you would use for the, the zirconia crowns. And, and as I said, the fees uh, 
will will range depending on where you are. Um, yeah, that's that's the description in the in the fee guide. The it's it's would be described as a prefabricated porcelain or ceramic substrate, and a D two nine two nine. Right. So in Canada, because um, uh, one of somebody just wrote, Chrissy wrote that that you're in Canada as well. Um, so my provincial fee guide, and I'm in Manitoba, does not recognize uh, a a crown like this. So we'll call it uh, a full coverage aesthetic crowns, and and then uh, we'll we'll bill it that way, and and we use our our guide as a guide, right, for the fee, not as a an absolute. Okay. Um, how long? How long have these two products been used together in the market? The the Ceramere and the um, Zirconia crowns, I assume you're asking about. Um, so the Ceramere and the Zirconia crowns we've been using for the anterior for a couple of years together. Both uh, I, the Ceramere has been around longer than that. Uh, the Zirconia anteriors have been around longer than the posteriors. Um, and kit price, I'm not sure what kit price you're, you're asking about, if you're asking about the zirconia crowns or if you're asking about the cement pricing. Um, is it minor small occlusal adjustments? Is it better to adjust opposing tooth versus the crown? I would rather adjust the opposing tooth versus the crown. Um, new smile, okay. New smile kits will come with, you'll get an anterior kit that will have laterals and centrals. You'll get a cuspid kit, uh, or you get a kit for first primary molar and second, and then a, another kit for second primary molar. Your first primary molar come in two varieties. You can have the regular or you can have a narrow. The narrow are slightly as it says, narrower, means you distally, and that's for cases where we've got loss of space. The narrow ones do come in very, very handy, and um, and they I do use them quite quite frequently. I probably use my narrow first primary molars more than I use the regular first primary molars. So the cost of the zirconia kit. So now that I asked you the question to clarify, I, I don't really know what the answer is. But if you go on their website for uh, for New Smile, uh, you can find out what the the kit prices are. And I know that if you oftentimes if you'll if you'll buy a kit, they'll give you a special pricing for the try-in crowns as well. So so sorry, I don't have a I don't have a great answer for for you on that. Ser you're using ceramic crowns for adult crowns. Yes, absolutely. And my my colleagues that uh, uh, are in my my speakers uh, forum or group or, or what have you from Catapult uh, use the ceramic for adult crowns, and they love them. Lots of uh, really good successes. Really high retention. Very low post-operative sensitivity. There you go. And here here you are from from uh, from John. Yes, yeah, ceramic has been used for last several years works great on all crown substrates for adults and kids. It, it really is a, a very nice product and um, you know a lot of times we we kind of shy away from it too because it's in a capsule and you think oh we've got to triturate it and, and the cost of it but but honestly if you're doing any kind of pediatrics you've got you got a triturator in your office anyway um, and the cost of the ceramic per crown is very comparable to what I would be using otherwise, uh, which is a resin modified glass ionomer cement. So very comparable in price between the two of them. There's there's very little little cost differential. Um, I just see another couple of uh, questions. No, I think we got it. Um, yes. So. Uh, there's a, a couple of, uh, I think you can all see that, that chat. Uh, Lisa has put in the uh, website for New Smile Crowns, so www.newsmilecrowns.com, and the Ceramir cement is uh, ceramirus.com. I think you can see that, that all in the chat box on the, on the bottom. Okay. Um, any other any other thoughts? Questions, comments? Oh, I thought I saw some thought, thought I saw somebody uh, 
typing, but uh, but nothing nothing coming up. I think that we'll um, I think we'll we'll sign off then. If uh, anybody wants to to get hold of me after the course, again, my email was on that that first uh, slide. It's Dr. Cohn at Shaw.ca. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for letting me into your your homes and your offices. Uh, been a pleasure speaking to you tonight.